Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are pleased to be joined by Randy Plogue. Randy Plogue is an affiliate assistant professor of art history and the coordinator of international programs for the College of Arts and Architecture at the Pennsylvania State University. He is the author of numerous publications, most notably the Monero Dawson Catalogue Raisonné, which represents the culmination of 15 years of research on the artist. The Met is the proud owner of three paintings by Monero Dawson, thanks to the generosity of donors Peter Lockwood, uh, the artist's grandson, and Louis Obie. Their gifts of two abstract oils and the figurative painting Three Graces greet visitors at the entrance to the Lila Atchison Wallace Wing here on the first floor and add an important dimension to our collection of American modernism. The title of tonight's lecture is Pablo Picasso and Monero Dawson, Separate Paths to Similar Destinations. Please join me now with a warm welcome for Dr. Randy Plogue. Thank you. Wow, if my undergraduate art history professors could see me now, <laughs> I made sure they heard about it, believe me. Um, I feel like Colin Firth at the Academy Awards, upon winning the Oscar for Best Actor, he said, I think my career has just peaked. <laughs> but. Uh, I'm, I don't want this to be about me this evening. I want it to be about Manir Dawson. I'm really just a messenger. And I know that this would not have been possible tonight if not for the publication of the Catalogue Raisonné. So I have to acknowledge my collaborators on, on that project. Um, Myra Berstow, I mean, it would, never would have happened without the, the dedication of, of Myra Berstow. She did all of the... Um, the legal work, all the permissions, um, contacting all of the collectors, both private and museums, and and but even more importantly, she was a morale officer. Over the years, when I start having doubts about this project, a few minutes on the phone with her, I was I would believe that anything was possible, and the publication of the book and tonight proved that she was right, and also Ani. Boyajan, is Ani here this evening? I didn't see her come in. Um, Ani edited the the publication. For, uh, she just walked in, <laughs> just on cue. <laughs> <laughs> I used to pride myself on my uh, attention. Uh, what am I trying to say? The my duration of, of my attention, my attention span. But then I started working with uh, Ani. Um, when it comes to proofreading and finding missing, noticing missing information or finding inconsistencies and things like that, her brain works on a different level than mine does. I, I have to admit that. Um, so the, the publication, the, the catalog resume would have never been ready for publication if not for Ani. So I have to acknowledge both um, Myra and, and Ani for their, their work on, on that publication for me, or with me. Oh, and I also mentioned that um, we have some relatives of the artist with us tonight. Uh, we have a grandson and a niece and other relatives who knew him during his lifetime. So. Um, afterwards, um, we might try, if you have any questions, we'll try to get you together with, with some of the relatives. Um, so, On December 16, 1912, Menear Dawson in Chicago received a letter from Arthur B. Davies in New York inviting him to send a few of his most novel paintings for inclusion in the International Exhibition of Modern Art later known as the Armory Show. Dawson lamented, what can I send? All of my good stuff is at the Humps. The Humps was the family name for their summer retreat in rural Michigan, a few miles south of Ludington. The previous June, Dawson was granted his first vacation in 18 months. His production for all of 1911 and half of 1912, two of his most prolific years of his enti entire career, 
had overwhelmed the small 11 by 14 spare room that he used as a studio and began to accumulate in other parts of the family's 24th Street Chicago home. This was an ongoing problem. His younger brother Mitchell once complained, ask Meneer what's to be done with his pictures. We are not going to let the front room remain a storeroom. <laughs> so with his vacation in June 1912, Dawson transported most of his paintings to Michigan. When Dawson received Davy's letter that December, the Lake Michigan Ferry had ceased operations for the season, so he had no way to retrieve what he considered his best work. He wrote in his journal, what I have here are small paintings that would be lost in the assemblage Davies intends, and my three graces is like a Pompeian wall painting. Having yet to exhibit anything outside his parents' home, Dawson was apparently intimidated by Davies' invitation and concluded that he had nothing appropriate to send to New York. We can only imagine how his life and career would have been different had he sent the Three Graces to Davies for inclusion in the Armory Show. However, I can assure you that he would be shocked to know that many of us today consider this painting among his finest and he would be astonished to see it hanging in a prominent location at the entrance to the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Modern American Galleries along with these two abstract gems. For, mu for museum visitors with a basic knowledge of the history of modern art, Dawson's The Three Graces is reminiscent of the cubism of Pablo Picasso. It contains some stylistic elements associated with cubism, arguably the most influential style of the 20th century. Cubism was indeed widely imitated on both sides of the Atlantic. Furthermore, the association of Dawson with Picasso is not limited to lay museum visitors. Dawson's paintings have been included in exhibitions demonstrating the influence of Cubism on American artists. Members of my own dissertation committee insisted that I explore possible links between Dawson and European artists. And Mary Matthews Ghetto, who was previously the most prolific writer on Dawson, described his borrowed compositions, including the Three Graces, as cubist transliterations. However, the relationship between Dawson's The Three Graces and Picasso's Cubism is not as direct as one might think. The Three Graces was painted in 1912 and Dawson was not aware of Picasso's work until the Armory Show in 1913. Even more telling, Dawson began painting in a very similar geometric style in late 1908 when it was impossible for the Chicagoan whose only travel outside his hometown had been to rural Michigan to have known the recent innovations of Picasso and George Brock. To continue the metaphor of my title, Dawson did not follow the path established by Picasso. In my lecture this evening, I will demonstrate how Dawson arrived at this style of painting so similar to Picasso's cubism without relying on Picasso or other European cubists. His source was American and available in his native Chicago. In short, his source was his college curriculum. Picasso's path to cubism has been thoroughly examined. I will re recap the conventional textbook explanation of, of it here only to establish a context for our look at Dawson's journey. Fundamental to Picasso's development of cubism was his fascination with sculptural form, which is evident in his portrait of Gertrude Stein, begun in 1905 and finished in 1906, now in the Metz collection. After seeing the Iberian sculpture exhibition in the Louvre in 1906, Picasso repainted the face of Stein's portrait and painted two nudes later that year. He painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon in June and July of 1907 after visiting the Musée d'Ethnographie de Trocadero where he saw African masks that he incorporated into the painting. That fall, the 1907 Salon d'Automne included a memorial exhibition for Paul Cezanne that brought the artist to Picasso's attention. Spanning the end of that year and beginning in 1908, he painted Three Women, which has been described as his version of the Three Graces. 
with their multiplicity of views, Woman in an Armchair and Still Life of the Bottle of Rum, both in the Mets collection, exemplify mature analytic cubism. Even in this cursory survey, the defining traits of Picasso's cubism are evident. The symptoms of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean the characteristics of cubism <laughs> include a focus on structure at the expense of color, a use of faceted surfaces depicting even organic forms like the human body in geometric shapes, a merging of foreground with the background, rendering the subject almost indistinguishable from its surroundings, and the use of multiple views, showing front and side views, for example, simultaneously. Dawson's path to the Three Graces can be traced over exactly the same period, beginning in 1905, but it takes an entirely different route. His view from Woods was probably painted in the summer of that year when he had just graduated from high school. He had already abandoned the romantic imitation of moonlit landscapes in favor of mundane subjects such as these leafy limbs, here compressed into the extreme foreground resulting in two-dimensional arrangement of shapes. This is consistent with the design principles espoused by Arthur Wesley Dow, which I believe were taught to Dawson by his high school art teacher. These same principles were used to great effect by Dow's most famous pupil, George O'Keefe, represented here by her black iris on display upstairs in the modern galleries. Dawson painted his, this still life with flat areas of color and exaggerated perspective in 1906, the same year the Art Institute exhibited Frank Lloyd Wright's massive collection of Japanese woodcut prints, including this one by Andro Hiroshige. Through 1906, 1907, and most of 1908, Dawson devoted much of his production to figurative landscapes painted from his imagination. Some of these landscapes have visionary qualities reminiscent of Arthur B. Davies. Dawson had seen some early sketches by Davies in the possession of a family friend, but he could have also seen later works by Davies in the Art Institute's annual juried exhibitions. After making paintings like Adam and Eve throughout most of 1908, Dawson made a dramatic change near the end of that year. In his journal on December 26, 1908, he referred to his prior works as somewhat cartoon-like, primitive arrangements. But now, he added, I feel I am beginning to grasp something that may eventually be of worth, certainly to myself and maybe to others. Obviously, this was a pivotal moment in his development. How it came about is key to understanding his work. We will return to it, but first I want to give you a brief overview of how this divergence led to the Three Graces and a few subsequent paintings. After painting House and Arch and Houses in, in late 1908, Dawson wrote in his journal, This winter I am very hard at work, Saturdays and Sundays, on several arbitrarily constructed paintings of arranged figures, blocking things out without rhyme or reason other than to make the picture look right. The result was Scarp, Germinal, and Flowering Twilight all finished in February 1909. Please excuse the black and white image. Uh, Flowering Twilight was sold in 1914 and has not been located. 1910 was a year of diverse experimentation. His series of head studies continued his geometric style, but he also painted a series of, of abstractions during that first half of that year, including this triptych, which on the surface seems to have nothing in common with his other work of this period. Indeed, it, has, it is unlike anything in American art to that time. Unless some currently unknown work comes to light, these were the first abstract paintings by an American artist. Scholars have compared prognostic to the early abstractions of Vasily Kandinsky. The comparison is valid, but prognostic predates Kandinsky's first abstractions by at least a year. 
This example from the Stieglitz collection was on display upstairs when I was here in April. I suspect it's going to be in the Stieglitz <coughs> exhibition opening in a couple of weeks. <coughs> Along with prognostic, during the first half of 1910, Dawson also painted XDX and coordinate escape that achieve a severity of abstraction that Kandinsky would not reach for another decade. Dawson later wrote that his early abstract, his her, his early abstract experiments were interrupted by his departure for Europe in mid-June 1910. His six-month tour of Europe took him across England, France, Switzerland, down through Italy as far south as Pompeii. He left scores of watercolors, but these are the only two surviving oil paintings from his trip. In Siena that September, Dawson found himself staying at the same pensione as John Singer Sargent. In conversation with Sargent, Dawson explained this painting on the left, saying, it is from a theme suggested by the corner of the fountain and the jar below it, but it is not an attempt to make a copy of either. Returning north through Paris in November, Dawson used a letter of introduction from a colleague to call upon Gertrude Stein attending one of her famous Saturday evening soirees with a painting under his arm. Her purchase of that painting in her apartment that evening was the first sale of his career. Describing her apartment, he wrote, well, there was much confusion and the light was not good. One could see an extraordinary jumble of paintings, a few of them remarkable and well worth examining. However, if he saw any Picassos, they made no impression on him. Instead, it was a Cezanne that caught his eye, and he was directed to, the gal to a gallery on Rue Lafitte, undoubtedly Ambrose Villard's, where he saw more Cezannes the following Monday. Dawson could have seen Picasso's three women in Stein's apartment, but I remind you that he was already painting in a faceted geometric style nearly two years before his visit to Stein's apartment. Stopping in New York upon his return to the United States, Dawson introduced himself to Arthur B. Davies, a meeting arranged by their mutual friend in Chicago. After examining the few paintings and photos Dawson had with him, Davies advised his young visitor to return to the figure. <coughs> Dawson obliged, but wrote that he had, was inclined in that direction independent of Davies' advice. The majority of Dawson's work through the next two years was figurative. I like to point out that Dawson is the only American artist of his generation to return from Europe painting more conservatively than when he left. <laughs> Many of his paintings from this period, like Struggle, are even more faceted than the Three Graces, but do portray human figures. A few of these figurative compositions were borrowed from art history, like the Three Graces. This brings us to our slide identification quiz for this evening. See if you can identify Dawson's source for each of the next few paintings. This is probably one of the most difficult, but I put it up first because it was one of the first paintings he completed after his trip, uh, after his return from Europe. Uh, completed in January, in the early February, uh, immediately after his trip to Europe. And it's from Correggio's Deny. A number of years ago, I projected a number of Dawson's paintings for my colleagues in the art history department at Penn State, and our Italianist said, oh yes, I recognize that hand. And I said, you see a hand? I withhold the title of this one because it would give it away. This is retrospect at the Museum of Modern Art, just down the street. Uh, but it's also one of the most abstract, so it makes it pretty difficult to identify. Titian's Pastoral Concert. And this is one of the easiest ones, in my opinion, because of the window and the light. And it is from the Met's own Young Woman with a Water Pitcher by Vermeer. 
Many other paintings from this period, most notably Venus and Adonis and the Hirshhorn's woman bathing, appear to be from Old Master sources but have not been identified. Minerva in the Palmer Museum of Art at Penn State and abstraction of figure are still figurative, but in the latter months of 1912, Dawson returned to abstraction. In March 1913, he wrote that he had painted nothing but abstractions since November. When the Armory Show closed in New York in mid-March 1913, a slightly smaller version of the exhibition traveled to the Art Institute of Chicago, opening there on March 24th. Upon reading advanced publicity for the exhibition, Dawson wrote, The paper mentioned several names unknown to me, mostly French. I recall talk at Miss Stein's. The name Matisse sounds familiar, and I think that Picasso is in the talk, too. Dawson attended the exhibition on the first day and met Walter Pock, a friend of Davies who was traveling with the exhibition. Pock came to dinner at the Dawson home, selected a freshly varnished painting, dubbing it Wharf Under Mountain, and clandestinely hung it among the Armory Show in the Art Institute. As in New York, the Armory Show in Chicago was a success by scandal. Chicagoans flocked to the exhibition to jeer at the art, but Dawson embraced it. These are without question the most exciting days of my life, he wrote. I am feeling elated. I had thought of myself as an anomaly, had to defend myself many times as not crazy. And here, now, at the Art Institute, many artists are presented showing these very inventive departures from the academies. Seeing the Armory Show bolstered Dawson's self-confidence. Only three months earlier, he declined to send the Three Graces to Davies, but after seeing the exhibition, he readily allowed Pock to sneak Wharf Under Mountain into the Art Institute. This newfound confidence is also reflected in his work, with the production of some of his boldest compositions of his career in 1913, such as The Square and Past Correlations. These paintings could be described as cubist abstractions. But, as I will show, their origins are completely independent of Picasso or European Cubism. To understand how Dawson got to this point artistically, we need to go back to 1905 when he graduated from high school. He had already demonstrated an interest in painting, but his father had high professional expectations for his sons, so Meniere reluctantly enrolled in the civil engineering program at the Armour Institute of Technology, now the Illinois Institute of Technology, on the near south side of Chicago, roughly a dozen blocks from his home. During his senior year at Armour Tech, he wrote, engineering holds some fascinations, but if I could choose a life's work, it would be the painting of pictures. Upon graduation in May 1909, he was immediately employed by the prominent architectural firm of Hollibird and Roche, whose headquarters were on the top floor of the Monadnock building on the southern edge of the Chicago Loop, also within walking distance of the Dawson home. Most of what we see in Dawson's paintings that resemble European modernism is a result of his civil engineering education. The dramatic change that took place in Dawson's painting in late 1908, the middle of his senior year at Armour Tech, resulted from combining the engineering studies he pursued in the classroom with, his paintings, with the paintings he produced at home. His engineering education is fundamental to understanding Dawson as an artist and is, in fact, the basis for nearly all of his art throughout this formative period of his career, from 1908 to 1915. Prerequisite for any study of engineering is a knowledge of mechanical drawing. The Armour Tech Bulletin of 1906 included mechanical drawing among the, require, among the requirements for admission to the College of Engineering. The building in Dawson's House and Arch defies the laws of perspective, destroying the illusion of three-dimensional form resulting in a flat image that resembles European modernism. In actuality, it is an elevation oblique view, 
in which the front side is in true shape and all visible lines are accurate to scale. For this reason, an elevation oblique drawing is far more practical than a perspective drawing, and it was a type of drawing that meant any engineering student would have used on a daily basis. To accurately depict an object in almost any mechanical drawing, the object is defined within a series of planes or around an axis, uh, around axes established through the use of construction lines. Construction lines do not necessarily define the shape of an object. They are preliminary reference lines that help establish the shape of the object and are usually erased once the drawing is completed. A typical characteristic of construction lines is that they extend beyond the point of intersection. This is the case in almost every intersection in this example. Dawson's paintings are full of lines that continue past the point of intersection or between or beyond the edge of the object they define. Here are just a few examples in Venus and Adonis. Examples can also be found in the Three Graces. Note, for example, how the line established by the center woman's arm continues well beyond her hand. To teach students how to visualize an object in space from multiple directions, a basic mechanical drawing instructional device, uh, an instructional method, is to uh, encourage students to imagine an object in a glass box and determine exactly what the object would look like from each of the six sides of the glass box. To depict these separate views on a sheet of paper, students are encouraged to mentally unfold the glass box. Diagrams of this instructional device resemble some of Dawson's paintings with large adjacent planes of color like the instructional glass box equation in the Joslin Art Museum in Omaha, includes traces of an object, perhaps a head, behind these translucent planes. The result of the unfolding process looks like this, with an actual drawing looking more like this. The dimensions of the object are extended from one view to the next by projection lines. Well, fold lines or reference lines are used as a reference for transferring the other dimensions from one view to the next. Parallel lines that extend from the subject, like projection lines, are common in Dawson's paintings. Here are just a, a couple examples in um, Woman at Bath and Venus and Adonis. Of course, each of these various views within the drawing shows the object in, in precise profile. This characteristic of mechanical drawing is also found in Dawson's paintings, most noticeably in his still lifes. For example, the tops of presumably round vessels are depicted as straight lines, as if they are exactly eye level. This is a highly abstracted still life from 1910. This is urns from 1911. And this is vase and samovar from 1915. This characteristic of Dawson's style is most obvious in another painting from 1915 appropriately titled Profiles. Along the right edge is a fireplace mantle surrounded by a potted plant. In front of the fireplace is an end iron. Opposite the fireplace, on the other side of a table with a vase of flowers and a stand with a piece of fruit, is a newel post at the base of a flight of stairs. But 1915 was also the year Dawson married, so he incorporated the torso of his 17-year-old bride. <laughs> All depicted in perfect profile view, just as an engineer would in a mechanical drawing. In fact, aspects of this painting replicate details of a standard architectural drawing of a staircase. An, exam 
an example is this plate from a book on colonial architecture of Philadelphia published in 1890. It shows the plane and elevation of a stair hall of the Thomas Mansion. In the elevation view, everything is depicted in perfect profile. For example, the tread of the step eight inches from the floor and the tread of the step eight feet from the floor and all treads in between are all depicted at exactly eye level, like the top of the mantel and the top of the table in Dawson's painting. But the most intriguing aspect of this comparison is perhaps its smallest detail. The nose of the tread of each step protruding out from behind the stair rail in the drawing is a detail repeated in Dawson's painting. After working in the drafting room of an architectural firm for five years, Dawson certainly would have been familiar with elevation views of stair halls like this one. Mechanical drawing is it's by its nature a linear medium. You may have already noticed this linear quality of mechanical drawing also is also found in many of Dawson's works. This is especially evident in his abstractions like meditation and statement where he used line as an independent design element. Carried to an extreme it results in compositions like the square. The linear quality of statement and meditation bears some resemblance to Picasso's drawing of a standing figure that was owned by Alfred Stieglitz, who loaned it to the Armory Show. Dawson would have seen Picasso's drawing in 1913, but Dawson's style exhibited this linear quality by 1910. And Dawson wrote about the power of line in 1908. I have the strong feeling in looking at the masters that the most recognizable communication is in the lines. The subtle direction of a line and its relationship to other lines can give excitement of great moment. All of these mechanical drawing methods are very basic. They were prerequisite for acceptance into all of the engineering programs at Armor Tech and would have been second nature to Dawson as an engineering student and later a professional engineer. I now turn to his civil engineering curriculum itself, especially one particular component of that curriculum. A hundred years ago, before steel reinforced concrete was widely accepted, masonry construction was still the norm. Given the properties of stone, the arch as the basis for the vault, the groin vault, the niche, and the dome was the structural form fundamental to most civil engineering projects. And of course, that pivotal painting of 1908, House and Arch, includes an arch and is the first in a series of paintings in which the arch becomes increasingly abstracted. In two paintings titled Wall of Arches, the arches retain most of their architectural integrity but are set in nebulous surroundings. In Sun Through Arch and this untitled painting, the shapes of the arches are irregular, eroding their solidity. In differentials, the arches have dissolved into abstract parabolic arc forms. In differential complex, the palette has been brightened and the arcs have been superimposed over a system of perpendicular lines. From here, it is a short step to the prognostic triptych. So the roughly parabolic arc forms in prognostic derive from masonry arches. Civil engineers had to be able to determine the exact shape of each side of every stone in masonry arches and related structures. This could be accomplished through two methods, graphically using descriptive geometry and mathematically employing analytic geometry. In Dawson's era, before calculators and computers, the graphic process was preferred. By graphic, I mean that these problems were worked out on the drawing board. According to the Armor Tech Bulletin, a course devoted to this essential skill called stereotomy was required during the second semester of his sophomore year. For Dawson, that was the winter of 1907. 
A quick definition of stereotomy is the application of descriptive geometry to stone cutting. The required textbook for this course was Stereotomy, Problems in Stone Cutting by S. Edward Warren, first published in 1884. Warren's textbook was organized by structure types, progressing from plain or flat-sided structures to developable or curved surfaces, then to warp surfaces and finally to surfaces curved in two di directions. Presenting the graphic, presenting the descriptive geometry process, Dawson's, Warren's textbook relied heavily on diagrams. It included 73 illustrations and 10 fold-out plates. <coughs> Plain side structures, buttresses, piers, and abutments were covered in the first few pages and in plate one. The remainder of the text was devoted to structures with curved surfaces. Basic exercises included the mechanical construction of circles, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas by projecting points from perpendicular axes as, part, as seen in plate two. The exercise was rapidly escalated in complexity as these techniques were applied first to structures of surfaces curved in one direction, such as a straight arch, then to structures containing warp surfaces, such as an oblique arch or a compound wing wall, and finally to structures containing surfaces curved in two directions, such as niches and domes. Warp surfaces, like this curved and sloping wing wall, presented the greatest challenge for students. Some of the diagrams in Warren's stereotomy textbook were the direct source for motifs in Dawson's paintings. This wing wall in the extreme upper left corner of Warren's plate eight has the same general configuration as the wall of arches painting. Likewise, the two arches in the upper right corner of, of Warren's plate two are strikingly similar to the two arches in the upper right corner of Dawson's other wall of arches painting. The configuration of two concentric curves intersected by four radiating straight lines in the top left corner of prognostic right wing replicates voussoirs of an arch. And, and the construction lines in Warren's illustrations are similar to the irregular, irregular grid in all three canvases of the prognostic triptych. While the graphic process was emphasized, civil engineering students were also required to know the mathematical process using analytic geometry. Analytic geometry employs a coordinate system based on vertical and horizontal axes, allowing points along curves such as parabolas, hyperbolas, and circles to be assigned numbers. Through this coordinate system, lines and surfaces such as the curve of an arch, vault, dome, or wing wall can be defined by an algebraic equation. In this method, equations replace the mechanical drawing. Vertical and horizontal lines, the major compositional elements of x dx and coordinate escape, replicate the x and y axes of analytic geometry. In addition to defining the shape of structures, civil engineers also had to ensure that these structures would function properly. Along with analytic geometry, Dawson's analytical mechanics and strength of materials courses included calculus and differential calculus. In short, the partial derivative symbol, the lowercase sigma, the lowercase delta, and the integral symbol, all symbols used in mathematics can be found in XDX or coordinate escape. Furthermore, all of Dawson's first abstractions, except for prognostic, have mathematical terms in their titles. XDX is itself a basic expression in differential calculus. To return to our subject for this evening, let's look again at the description of the stereotomy course in the Armour Tech Bulletin. It specifies that each student works out a complete drawing of each problem. 
developing the surfaces and lines of intersection, and finally develops a complete pattern of a stone of the structure. When I said that civil engineers had to be able to determine the exact shape of each side of every stone in a masonry construction, I was not exaggerating. Dawson had to not only determine the shape of each stone within the structure, he also had to be able to provide a stone cutter with a template for each side of the finished stone. Here in Warren's plate three, the dotted lines represent the size of a rectangular stone necessary to produce the finished stone of a prescribed size and shape. Warren's plate four addresses the creation of a pattern for each side of the stone. This is in effect the, un the unfolding of the stone. Warren's illustration of this process resembles a faceted surface like the faceting on Dawson's paintings, beginning with Germinal painted two years after he completed this course. This unfolding process, if not this illustration itself, was undoubtedly the source for Dawson's faceted style in his figurative paintings like Struggle and The Three Graces. However, the solid blocks in Warren's illustrations bear stronger resemblance to Dawson's geometric paintings, geometric abstractions like past correlations. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering, Dawson got a B in his stereotomy course. <laughs> In 1910, as he made his way across France to Paris, he stopped in Amiens. He wrote, Amiens Cathedral is my first experience with the marvels of French Gothic, which presents the most, perf most nearly perfect structural logic to be found anywhere. Our skyscrapers are sound in interior bones and plan, but our elevations are fraudulent and conceal that sound interior. He included a description of Gothic construction worthy of an art history textbook, outlining the role of the flying buttress and the function of the pinnacles, concluding, the visible forms of the churches reveal the structural necessities. Note that he did not comment on the awe-inspiring verticality of the interior space or the symbolism of the stained glass windows or the beauty of the sculpture. As we should expect from an engineer, his comments were reserved for its structure. Near the end of his European tour, he wrote, I think I have been most affected by Cezanne, who, in the few works I have seen, doesn't take the scene at face value, but digs into the bones and shows them. Whether he was considering a medieval cathedral or modern skyscraper or a Cezanne painting, it was structure, the bones, as he put it, that fascinated him. He even used the same vocabulary to describe it. So when, we, when he chose to examine old master paintings, his interest was not the subject or the symbolism or the brushstroke, that was their pictorial structure. In Gainsborough's Blue Boy, for example, he observed how the dark clouds framed the brightly lit face of the young man. How the light filtering through the clouds just happens to echo the shape of the shoulder and straight arm on one side and the bent elbow on the other side. And how the dramatically sloping landscape is parallel to a line established by the forearm and continues through the other hand. It was structural elements such as these that Dawson identified and accentuated in his versions of the old masters. This interest in structure is one characteristic Dawson had in common with Picasso. The Three Graces also has a limited palette, but this is more representative of its Pompeian source than Dawson's work in general. His forms are faceted, reflecting his geometry and stereotomy courses. And his imitation of mechanical drawing construction lines blurs the boundary between the subject and the background, eliminating spatial depth. Somewhat surprisingly, the one common characteristic of Picasso's cubism that we do not find in Dawson's work is the use of multiple views. 
John Berger, in his landmark essay on Cubism, The Moment of Cubism, published in 1969, proposed metaphors for the changing relationship between art and nature throughout the centuries. According to Berger, the Renaissance artist imitated nature like a mirror. The mannerist and classicist reconstructed examples from nature similar to a theater stage. The 19th century artist experienced nature and presented it in their art as a personal account. According to Berger, the quoting Berger, the metaphorical model of cubism is the diagram. The diagram being a visible symbolic representation of invisible processes, forces, and structure. What is mechanical drawing if not diagrammatic? I propose that Berger's metaphor was Dawson's source. The diagram in the form of mechanical drawing and descriptive geometry was the model for Dawson's paintings. I have revealed that Dawson was not a stellar engineering student, but this was not an accurate measure of his intellect. Entries in his journal reveal glimpses into his thoughts on the relationship among painting, architecture, and music, and the relationship between each of these arts and nature. The parallel between his mechanical drawings and his early paintings as two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional structures would not have escaped him. He would have perceived them as conceptual equivalents. Both were graphic and imitative. The pivotal event in his artistic development occurred when he realized that he could relate his paintings to his engineering drawings. Armed with this realization, he pondered the conceptual equivalent of the non-graphic mathematical representation of three-dimensional structures. The real-world application of a symbolic language of algebraic equations to the curve of an arch or the slope of an embankment gave him the idea and justification for abstract art. Descriptive geometry is a graphic process closely akin to the mechanical drawing in general, but it is more concerned with the properties of individual components than with the appearance of the whole, similar to the fragmentation of Dawson's paintings. Berger's explanation of a diagram being a visible representation of an invisible processes, forces, and structure could be describing Dawson's stereotomy course. Berger credits the cubists with breaking the illusion of three-dimensional form and space that had existed in painting since the Renaissance. According to Berger, they did not destroy it, they broke its continuity. In elevation oblique drawing, ignores the basic principles of visual perception, such as the fact that distant objects appear smaller and receding lines are foreshortened. Each tread of a flight of stairs, and for that matter the floor and the ceiling being, a, being at exactly eye level at the same time is a physically impossible. And unfolding a block of stone defies the laws of physics. But these methods do not destroy form and space. They are alternate representations of form and space, like cubist paintings. The parallels between Dawson's geometric style and Picasso's cubism may, in fact, run deeper than their surface appearance. Dawson took his stereotomy course during the winter term of 1907. He painted his first faceted geometric paintings exactly two years later in January, February of 1909. He had painted in faceted geometric style for almost two full years before visiting Stein's apartment in November of 1910. Yes, he could have seen examples of Picasso's work among her collection, and he might have heard his name mentioned there. But his description of that visit and later remarks in his journal make it quite apparent that he was not familiar with Picasso until the Armory Show. The Three Graces is dated 1912 and is referenced in his journal that December when he received Davies' letter. It was not derived from European Cubism. 
I contend that Dawson took an entirely separate and independent path to this very similar destination. I'll conclude with two brief postscripts. When the Armory Show was in New York, Marcel Duchamp's new descending a staircase was singled out for ridicule by the press. One critic's description of it as resembling an explosion in a shingle factory almost single-handedly made the painting famous. The Chicago press was watching and sharpening its fangs. However, when the exhibition came to Chicago, it was Picasso's woman with a mustard pot that received the brunt of the critic's wrath. For example, one paper interpreted the painting as depicting the morning after at the Des Plaines Street Police Court and the mustard pot as Exhibit A. <laughs> but Dawson was not deterred. He wanted to buy it. He wrote in his journal, I have $200. I have begged father to lend me enough so I can buy Picasso's woman with a pot of mustard for 324. Father is disgusted with the idea of taking such a thing home. I said it would look marvelous over the mantle in the library. That to him was a horrible thought. I may have to settle for Duchamp's study of a nude at $162, which is larger, almost as large as a nude descending the staircase. Dawson did settle for Duchamp's nude, uh, study of a nude. It hung above the mantle in his father's library for two years until Dawson bought his own home in Michigan. He owned the Duchamp for nearly 10 years before he sold it to Walter Pock. Within a few days, Pac wrote that Duchamp had visited his apartment and wrote its proper title on the back. Jeune homme triste dans un train, sad young man on a train. Pac sold the painting to Peggy Guggenheim when she opened her The Art of This Century Gallery here in New York in 1942. It now hangs in the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice, Italy. And finally, I have one more slide identification quiz for you. It represents the most direct intersection between Dawson and Picasso. Dawson's woman in brown is derived from Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein. Dawson painted, Dawson's painting is not dated, but it is too accurate to, to its source to be painted from memory, so it must have been painted after June 1913 when Picasso's portrait of Stein was reproduced in Alfred Stieglitz's quarterly journal, Camera Work. By then, he had seen and even coveted at least some of Picasso's work, but he had actually met and spent an evening with Stein, who was responsible for the first sale of his career. Whether he was more intrigued by the composition or the subject of this portrait is unclear. Thank you. <laughs>